And today I want to speak about your year of Jubilee from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. You know what the year of Jubilee is? It's the year of freedom. In the nation of Israel, every 50th year was called the year of Jubilee. And this is what happened on the 50th year. All debts were cancelled. If you owed some money, it was cancelled. All lands Return to their original owners or their descendants. And if you were a slave, you were set free. And the land was not tilled for a whole year. It was the year that everybody was looking forward to. The year of freedom, the year of liberation, the year of jubilee. When people would experience release from all the burdens that they were carrying. One day Jesus walked in to his, uh, the synagogue in his own hometown. The people in his hometown were not very receptive to him. That's the case. Usually, Jesus said a prophet has no honor has honor except in his own country, Jesus said. Jesus walked into his synagogue in Nazareth and the attendant gave him the scriptures, the Old Testament, turned to Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and he read those words that we find quoted in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. And then he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. Let's turn to Luke's gospel chapter 4. I believe the Lord wants to, us to experience his liberation even this morning. Luke's gospel chapter 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this is the quotation, not word for word, but verse 18. Let's read it together, okay? Verses 18 to 19. This is the statement about the year of Jubilee. And the last line you see there in verse 19, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord means the year of Jubilee. You get it? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that term means the year of jubilee or the year of freedom. Now listen to what Jesus says. All together now, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. 
Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Capernaum was his ministry headquarters. That's where he did many miracles like turning water into wine and so on. Verse 24, then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing to the midst of them, he went his way. Jesus made a, a stunning announcement. The stunning announcement was, this day, this word is fulfilled. I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah 61. I am the fulfillment of all the prophecies in the Old Testament. This day is your year of jubilee. This day you have freedom and in me and through me you have freedom. That was a revolutionary statement enough to make the religious establishment furious. Because usually religious establishments are against the reality of God's working in their lives. In people's lives. Throughout history, religion has been one of the most oppressive forces of humankind. But Jesus did not come to bring a religion. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is about God revealing himself as the redeemer of the world to humankind. We are not propagating a religion. We are propagating the truth of the gospel that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. You can follow all the rituals of religion, even the Christian religion, because there are rituals in Christianity, and even Pentecostals have their own rituals. That is not going to give you salvation. Salvation, redemption comes through a relationship with God. And that relationship comes only when you break down before God. That's why Jesus said, I have come... Look at that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Read that after me, okay? Together with me now. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, what is meant by this poor? Does it mean economically poor? No, primarily it talks about those who are poor in spirit. Because poverty is not going to save your soul. Just because you're a poor person, that doesn't bring you salvation. When this word is used in the Old Testament, the first time, it is used of Moses. Moses had been raised in the Egyptian palace. But what he's telling about Moses is that he had a meek and humble spirit. So what it is saying is that God's salvation and deliverance comes to people who are broken and humble before him. Sometimes people who are economically poor, who are destitute, find it easier to be humble because they know that they are helpless and powerless. But that in and by itself does not save. Salvation, a relationship with God, encounter with God, is based on the foundation of humility and brokenness. God dwells among the broken people and those who are contrite in spirit. Now, what do we mean by that? Those of us who know that our, our poverty spiritually before God, that we can do nothing of ourselves, that we need God's help, and who come before him with brokenness, knowing that he's the only one who can save our souls and touch our lives and transform us. And that is reinforced by the statement, he, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, those who's, who feel broken before God. 
He came to deliver the captives, those who know that they are bound before God. And they need his help and deliverance. Unfortunately, even people who are really bound don't realize that they are bound. There's nothing that God hates more than pride and arrogance. In James chapter 4, writing to the early Christians, James said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And throughout history, God has worked through humble people. Sometimes poor people can be proud. Sometimes they can be humble. Rich people can be arrogant, but they can be also humble. It all depends on how God is working in your life. This last week, I was went to the hospital to visit somebody and, and uh, came out. And uh, uh, I had in my car a fabulous piece of cake, which was... Uh, Distributed at a great celebration, and it was made in the best place probably in Sri Lanka. And I looked at it, and I really loved it. But uh, I had tested my blood sugar that morning, and it was pretty high. So uh, I had not been very careful about my eating over the weekend or whatever. So I knew, as lovely as it is, I don't think I can enjoy this. So I took it with me, uh, and it was in my car. And then I thought to myself, I drove into the hospital, there's that security guard there. This guy will never be able to eat this cake, even in his dreams. This is a fabulous cake. This is made in the best place, and at a great celebration, which I also enjoyed. So I... Went, visited, came back in the car, and I called the security guard. And I told him, I said, Mata, Honda cake kal latti, you know? Have I Mata eka kanda be? Oyata onida. I said, I have a fabulous piece of cake. I can't eat it. Do you like to have it? You know what he said? E moko. Mata e pa. What kind of thing is this? I don't want it. I put the window up. I brought the cake home. I know my wife is sweeter than she should be. <laughs> I gave it to her and she said, you know what this looks like? This looks like Swedish uh, marzipan uh, princess cake, you know. Now being Swedish, she, she really misses that. And she got a chance to uh, have that. That's why she's so sweet. <laughs> so, okay, the security guard's loss was Margarita's gain. <laughs> Sometimes people are like that. They know they are so poor, but they are too proud to break down before God. That's what you call rejecting and resisting God. And the people in the synagogue, the leaders in the synagogue, they were angry, they were furious when Jesus spoke because though they were impoverished people they were so proud and arrogant God always works through humble people and this story here uh, that Jesus uh, gives us tells us about people who broke down before him because God can do it but before we go there I believe the Lord wants to touch you right now Whatever your situation may be. Let's rise to our feet right now. What's wrong in breaking down before God? 
how many of you want God to touch you? You have a situation for which you need God's help. I want to tell you, I need God's touch. In my life, in my body, I need his touch. Only God can do it. Hallelujah. I want you to form a circle. Ladies with ladies, gents with gents. Now, don't be too proud. But if you don't want, you can sit down. That's all right. There's room and place for everybody at Calvary Church. Whether you agree with what we do or not, Calvary Church is your church. And there's a place for you. Okay? So if you don't want to join a group, that's fine. You just sit down. Nobody will bother you. But you can have the pleasure of God touching you today as we pray for one another. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. Whatever your need may be, as we are singing this hymn, I need thee every hour. I want you to find a place with four or five men or women. All right? Go there. You don't have to say anything. There are enough lay pastoral workers who will find their way. Share your burden, whatever it may be. Whatever is on your heart, you want prayer for healing, just ask the Lord to help you. He will touch you and make you whole. Wherever you are, whoever you are, do it. This is your moment. in our talents because he's given them to us he wants our heart you have the right heart then God can use you no matter whether you're a talented person or not praise God thank you you may be seated at Calvary Church we want Jesus to minister to every one of us there are no heroes here except the Lord there's no special person here except Jesus and the reason why we pray for one another here is so that you will learn how to pray so that when you go out there when you step out of this place walk out that's when actually worship also begins because your life is a life of worship that's when your personal worship and your personal ministry to other people begins one and a half hours is not worship we just get fed, we get instructed, we get guided, we get healed. Some people sometimes come to know the Lord here. We get stimulated to walk with the Lord, to go out and worship him in our daily life, wherever we are, without any shame about the gospel. Praise the Lord. But like I said, God works among humble people. And I think 
that's what he wants us to be in the coming days to ask the holy spirit to break us down so that he may anoint us and use us mightily wherever we are and sometimes the lord helps us to keep us in our place you know how he helps us he allows certain things to happen to us how many of you know that he allows people to knock against us he allows even some failures to happen sometimes we can only call upon god when we have our backs against the wall and when we have no one to turn to when you are so down that when you look up his bottom you see <laughs> you're in a proper state of mind for god to work and don't think that god is angry with you when things are not going your way doesn't mean god is angry with you just god allows things to happen because he wants to bring you to a place where he can minister to you now jesus gave two illustrations of broken people who were used by him one was a widow of zarephath interesting thing was that widow was not a jew so when these stories are told to jewish people they really get hopping mad that's why they were furious with jesus and often times jesus told some very radical stories to jewish audiences and the hero in the story was not a jew like the good samaritan <laughs> because the jews never thought samaritans were good <laughs> so it was really revolutionary for him to say that a jewish man was fallen and a samaritan whom they despised came and picked him up and this guy was the good guy in the story to make the samaritan or a gentile the hero in the story actually was courting disaster but jesus was not afraid and jesus said that in the time of drought and the story is in first kings chapter 17 talking about the year of jubilee which is the year when we can be set free whatever your situation whatever your problem whatever your need you are in the year of jubilee if you know jesus as your personal savior how many of you are in the year of jubilee because you know jesus as your personal savior yes from the day you came to know jesus as your personal savior you are in your year of jubilee no matter what mountain you had to climb what river you had to cross what valley you had to go through you are in your year of jubilee and the lord is with you and so he told about this woman during the time of drought and elijah had prophesied about it and then god told elijah go to zarephath which is in sidon which is a gentile place and there you will find a widow woman a mother who loved her child and she has nothing and uh, you go and she will feed you there now think about that the prophet is being fed by a woman who had nothing god loves to use people who have nothing I'm so thankful to the Lord. <laughs> I'm so thankful to the Lord that God loves to use people who have nothing because he wants to through them show who he is. And he went to this woman and when Elijah went the woman said I don't have anything. And Elijah said just take what you have and you just start using it and God will multiply it. And she began to take a step of faith because people who don't have anything you really had to move by faith and when you move by faith not by presumption but by faith because the holy spirit has led you when you move by faith god moves in on your behalf hallelujah and he does his mighty work that is the god we serve you got to be broken before god Then he told another story and that's about Naaman also a non-Jew Naaman was the commander of the army of Syria but he was a leper whom did God use to open Naaman's eyes how many of you remember your bible stories whom whom did God use 
the servant girl can you imagine that she was a jewess but god used her she was a helpless and the most powerless person in their home the powerless person was a person upon whom the spirit of the lord was and the amazing thing is that because the spirit of the lord was upon that woman even naaman who was such a big shot he was only used to taking orders from the king no one else gave him orders he was a military man he knew the structure of authority no one told him what to do but god used that little girl and then naaman goes to see the prophet elisha now see how god can use anybody even the top brass as long as you break down as long as you allow god to work in your life now he went to elisha's house and he expected elisha to come and take a bow before him like the japanese do you have a bad back don't go to japan <laughs> but elisha never came forward maybe the lord told him not to because as far as god is concerned no matter how big you are no one is bigger to god than his servants did you get that and you are his servant too okay i'm not just talking about myself you are his servant too because you're a child of god and his spirit is on you as far as god is concerned people may persecute us and push us aside and ignore us and all that sort of thing but as far as god is concerned no one is bigger to him than his servants and god felt that elisha should not go up to him that's where god works do you follow the protocol naaman got mad he was used to that respect then naaman was about to get into a chariot with his leprosy because of a small thing you know how stupid people can be your arrogance and your pride can keep you from getting what god wants you to get and sometimes the arrogance and pride and status is more important to people than god's touch on their lives that's such a sad thing like the security guard at the hospital he needed that piece of cake but his pride said what are you trying to do i don't want it they got in a chariot whom did god use there to get him to get out of the chariot and come back and eat humble pie naaman's servants read the bible story naaman's servants are the ones who told him now who listens to servants especially those days not a military man wouldn't listen to servants but his servants told him <laughs> why don't you why don't you go and you know do what he asked you to do perhaps you will get healed and thank god that better sense came to naaman and i thank god for all the naamans in this world who know that they are nothing before god and come before god and bow before him and say lord you're the biggest anybody can break down anybody can be used anybody can come before god god is not a respecter of persons but we come before him on the same terms as the widow of zarephath came you come to god not on your terms but on his terms there are so many people who are missing out on god who think that they are doing god a favor if in fact even in our pastoral work we we meet people all the time who think that because we call them and inquire after them and so on we are doing it for ourselves because we want to fill a chair or we want something sorry not at calvary church we don't do that here if you get a call from a pastor it's because they care for you for nothing in return they care for you because they love you and they're out there because god has put them there so don't spit on it you should be fortunate if you get a call if you get a visit 
That's what we are called to do. We do it because we love you. But I have no problem uh, with any of you. But occasionally, people think that, that uh, it's because we have nothing else to do or something like that. I don't know. I'm telling you from personal experience. When people break down before God, God loves it. And we don't do any favors to God. God gets nothing. He loses nothing if we reject him. Because he was there before we were born. Before we even thought of. He was there. Just because I turn my back on him and walk away from him, sometimes when prayers are not answered, people think they can teach God a lesson and they walk out. You say, really? Yes, really. Because we are the pastors, we know. Sometimes they don't tell you in those terms. They walk around God as if God is hurt and God is going to suffer. <laughs> God does not suffer. His essence, his nature does not change. No matter what we do. He's God. Remember? He's God. Don't we big shots sometimes say, doesn't he know who I am? <laughs> Brokenness is great before God. So anyway, one day I went to Peran Sons. <laughs> and... Uh, I got these, uh, a few, uh, I like uh, these uh, vegetable rotis. Uh, so I had a few in my bag. <laughs> and there was, a, there, was a, uh, there was a grocery store or a supermarket next door. So I came to the car and then I saw this security guard. I said to myself, uh, how can I eat this? And that fellow probably may not have seen it either in his dreams. Who knows? They, they are so costly these days. So I sat in my car and I called him. <laughs> and I said, do you have any children? He didn't answer. So then I said, uh, <clears throat> I have got something here which you can eat. Uh, do you like to have it? Uh, do you like this kind of thing? You know what he said? <laughs> he said, whatever you give, I will take it very gladly. Now, that's what you call breaking down, is it not? See the two security guards? It speaks about two kinds of people. Same condition, lost, broken, poor, wretched before God. One guy says, And the other guy says, Anything you give me, I will take it gladly. Isn't that wonderful to hear that? I'm sure he enjoyed every bite of it. I think I gave everything I had. Because here was a broken man. You can either be like the hospital security guard or you can be like the supermarket security guard, whatever. You break down before God, God will touch you. That's the kind of life we want to be, okay? Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's rise to our feet and sing that I need thee every hour again with a heart of brokenness before God because God is good and we are terrible but God makes us good by his mighty power. Hallelujah. And no matter what happens, God always wins. And even in this story we read about how they tried to throw him down the cliff. They took him to the top of the mountain and tried to throw him. But what did Jesus do? He walked right through them. It's like this. You can either move towards God or you can move away from God. Whether you walk towards God or away from God, God moves on. God moves on. I am the loser when I don't walk with God. You're the loser 
when you don't receive from God, nobody else loses. Oh, our hearts are broken sometimes when people react in the wrong way. But we ne God never loses. Let's sing humbly before him. I need thee every hour once again because I want us to have that attitude before God because he's going to touch and move mightily in the coming days. Gracious, loving, wonderful God. We need you more than anyone else in this whole wide world. And we are willing to fall down before you. Because you're our healer, our savior, our restorer, our deliverer, our king, our lord, our blessed master. We thank you, Lord, for who we are, who you are, and who we are in you. And we pray your blessing will be upon us as we seek to serve you this coming week. And now with the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the blessed Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.